I'm Bonnie Lin, Director of the China Power Project and Senior Fellow for Asian Security at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. In this episode of the China Power Podcast, we're discussing Professor Steve Zhang and Dr. Olivia Chung's new book titled The Political Thought of Xi Jinping. The book provides an in-depth analysis of the ideological foundations driving China's current leader Xi Jinping and his ambitious visions for the country's future. In our conversation today, we'll explore key themes and motivations behind Xi's political philosophy as outlined in the book. How does Xi's thought differ from previous CCP leaders like Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping? And what could this mean for China's domestic governance, social control, and its foreign policy? Joining us today is Professor Steve Zhang. Professor Zhang is director of the China Institute at SOAS University of London. He is also a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and an emeritus fellow of St. Anthony's College at Oxford. Professor Zhang earned his doctoral degree from Oxford and had worked there as a professorial fellow, dean, and director of the Asian Studies Center at St. Anthony's College. His new book, The Political Thought of Xi Jinping, was published by Oxford University Press in January of this year. Thank you for joining us today, Steve. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to begin this podcast by asking a bit about why did you write this book with Olivia on Xi Jinping's political thought? What makes Xi Jinping's political thought so important to study? Well, I started planning and preparing for this book back in 2017, after Xi Jinping announced that Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era had arrived and was being formally accepted into the party constitution and then the state constitution a year later. When he did that at the 19th Party Congress, it was clear to me that this is not just a vanity project like his two predecessors who liked to add some kind of ideological contributions. It was clear to me from the very beginning that Xi Jinping meant it to be something big, something that would effectively be used as the state ideology of China in due course. And that's why I started on that from the very beginning. And then, of course, later on, I was able to recruit Olivia to join with her help. We were able to do two years of very intensive research into what Xi Jinping thought really is about and draw out the significance of it, which therefore ends up in this particular book. Thank you, Steve. I'd like to offer our listeners a quick summary of your book's key findings first. So what are the most important takeaways from analyzing Xi Jinping's political thought? And what are your most important lessons learned from researching and writing your book? Well, I will answer your second question first, which is what really struck me the most when we have finished with this project. It was the scale of the ambition that Xi Jinping has for himself, for the Communist Party, and for China. Now, what is Xi Jinping thought really about? Domestically, it is about forging one country, one people, one ideology, one party, one leader. And this is what Xi Jinping is trying to do and has been doing in the last 11 plus years in control of China and the Communist Party. What then is the overall ambition of this, both domestic and external? That ambition is to secure the fulfillment of the China dream of national rejuvenation by 2049 or 2050 at the latest. What does the China dream of national rejuvenation mean? In layman's language, it is to make China great again. It is to make China the most modern, advanced, innovative, competitive, 
and even green country in the world, the natural leader of the global south and therefore of the world, a country that would be admired by everybody else and therefore be respected and followed by others. That is the scale of the ambition of what Xi Jinping would like China to do when the China dream of national rejuvenation has been accomplished. In terms of how ambitious Xi Jinping is, how does he compare to his predecessors, including Mao Zedong? And to what extent does Xi's thought differ from Mao's, as well as any of his predecessors? In other words, what makes Xi Jinping stand out and why does he need his own political thought? Xi Jinping does not really care too much about his three predecessors, whether we're talking about Hu Jintao or Zhang Jimin or for that matter, Deng Xiaoping. The only predecessor that Xi Jinping thought well of was Mao Zedong, the founder of the People's Republic of China. But here, Xi Jinping is not attempting a Maoist restoration. What Xi Jinping thought is, is in fact quite different from what Mao Zedong thought was. Mao Zedong thought was essentially a signification of Marxism-Leninism, meaning that Mao Zedong was trying to adopt and then adapt Marxism-Leninism, which was developed in Europe based on the experience of urban cities and the struggle of the proletariats and how that proletariat revolution would come to play and adapt that into the agrarian context of China where the, in quotation marks, the Chinese revolution was to be carried out in the countryside surrounding these cities. What Xi Jinping has done in what he calls in quotation marks, signification of Marxism, he is really talking about something very different. He is talking about making Marxism sinocentric. He is talking about Marxism as the ultimate development of Chinese civilization and culture and tradition, which could only happen because of the existence of the Communist Party to make the two work completely together. So you can see that there is a very significant difference. And there's also another difference here, which is that when Mao talked about Marxism, Leninism, he clearly acknowledged both the Marxist and the Leninist elements in that communist ideology. Xi Jinping who comes out very clearly in this book as one of the, or indeed the ultimate Leninist in the Communist Party of China, does not even mention Leninism at all. He would simply call it Marxism, deliberately ignoring the differences between Marxism and Leninism. So the version of communism that Xi Jinping advocates as part of Xi Jinping thought is something that Confucius, if you could bring him back from the grave from 2,000 years ago, would not recognize as Confucianist. Is something that if you can bring Marx back from the grave, he would not recognize it as Marxism either. It is something very different, very Sinocentric. Thank you, Steve. I'd like to follow up on the point you made that Xi differs greatly from his predecessors. It may be easier to understand this theoretical difference if there are concrete examples. What have you seen in terms of specific policy differences? Well, more specifically, if we are looking at China's foreign policy, then we are seeing Xi Jinping completely reversing Deng Xiaoping's hiding capability and biting for time approach to one which now is aggressively asserting that China requests and requires the rest of the world 
to pay it due respect. That China is now proactively going out to the rest of the world to mobilize support in the global south to enable China to transform the way the international organizations functioned in order to change how the international systems operate, transform it from a liberal international order into something that is fundamentally Sino-centric. And if we are looking at domestic policy, we are also seeing a reversal of the Deng Xiaoping, Zhang Jimin, Hu Jintao era of steadily relaxing the control of the party, allowing people to have more individual freedom and scope to do things their way into one which is now requiring people to learn to think the Xi Jinping way and to be united in support of the agenda set by the Communist Party, much tighter control across the board and therefore substantially reducing the scope for individual freedom and for scope for the private enterprises to push for development in their own particular ways. So Steve, how do these ambitions you mentioned to transform the international order to be Sinocentric and for there to be much more internal political control, how are these concepts linked in Xi Jinping thought? The central element of Xi Jinping thought is about increasing control of the Communist Party and making people in China to share the same world view so that they think like one people and act like one people guided by the ideology set by the party and its supreme leader with the party controlling increasingly elements of people's individual life and with the whole system now pivot around the supreme leader, the one single leader, whereas in the Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao era of some 20 years, the Communist Party steadily increased the scope of debate at the very top level of the Communist Party behind closed doors. Now, at that top echelon of the party, the Central Committee or the Politburo or the elitist Politburo Standing Committee have all been transformed into an echo chamber. They all now have to follow Xi Jinping's leadership and ideas. And that is a huge change. And just to make sure I understand, how does Xi Jinping's desire for control differ from those of his predecessors, including that of Mao? The difference between Mao and Xi Jinping is that in the Mao's era, it was the old-fashioned summary totalitarian control. Xi Jinping is attempting a modern digital approach of totalitarian control. So in many ways, it's a lot smarter in how it's being applied. So it doesn't have to cause the kind of upheavals that Mao caused, for example, by launching the Great Leap Forward or the Cultural Revolution. Xi Jinping can use digital technologies to enable him to control how people think, what they are studying, what they are allowed to read, and also to change the way how people behave. One of the things that he has done, for example, is over the Uyghur people in Xinjiang. From Xi Jinping's perspective, he is levering up. He is getting people in Xinjiang, the Uyghurs, to become more like mainstream patriotic Chinese who subscribes to the mainstream Chinese culture, who is loyal to the Communist Party and embrace the leadership of Xi Jinping. So all these are now happening without necessarily unleashing the whole country into chaos. So what you're saying is Mao is more willing to leverage social movements, protests, revolutions to advance his objectives, whereas she with advancement, new surveillance, and control technologies don't necessarily 
don't necessarily need these other forms of activities to exert his control. But similar to Mao, she also wants to maximize his power and control. Is that a correct understanding? Well, I think that is a good understanding of it, where I would add as an additional and very important distinction is that Mao Zedong was interested in Mao and the Maoist revolution and how changes should be implemented. But Mao was not so bothered with the Communist Party itself. Xi Jinping focused much more on the Communist Party. For him, something like the Cultural Revolution by which Mao unleashed the masses, the general public, to take on the Communist Party in order to follow Mao's idea was unthinkable under Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping will do it through the Communist Party, with the Communist Party, and by the Communist Party. And that's an important distinction. And maybe this is too basic of a question, but why is Xi Jinping so set on the Communist Party? Is it because it's the only party in China that he could leverage? and the one that he's from? Or is he really ideologically fixated and believe that the Communist Party is the only way to achieve what he believes is the best for China? Well, that is exactly the point. It is ideological. The big difference between Mao Zedong and Xi Jinping is that Mao Zedong was not ultimately a devoted Leninist. Xi Jinping is, if you like, the ultimate Leninist in China. For Xi Jinping, the Communist Party as a Leninist instrument of control is absolutely pivotal to everything he tries to do. So he will keep his control over the Communist Party. He will ratify the Communist Party almost continuously to make sure the Communist Party will always follow his order. This was something that Mao lost sight of and he effectively handed over the control of the Communist Party to his number two, Liu Xiaoqi. And then Mao Zedong had to launch the Cultural Revolution to seize power back from Liu Xiaoqi and the other Leninists in the Communist Party. Steve, you also mentioned in your book that Xi Jinping political thought also draws from Confucian traditions. Could you describe what those Confucian traditions are and to what extent do they clash? or work well with what you're describing as Xi's devotion to Leninism? If I had said that Karl Marx would not recognize the Marxism that Xi Jinping practices in China, I can extend that to say that Confucius, if he could be brought back from the grave, would not recognize what Xi Jinping says in his name either. If we have to push to the ultimate simplification, Confucianism is ultimately about doing the right thing in the judgment of history, not necessarily doing what the king emperor says or anybody else says. Is in the judgment of history what is the right thing that must be done. Now here, of course, Xi Jinping would believe that he is a Confucianist because he believes that he is the representation of the ultimate good. Therefore, whatever he says must be the right thing in the judgment of history. Except that is not what is supposed to mean in Confucianism, because that is not by judgment of yourself, it's the judgment of others coming after you. Now, what Xi Jinping is doing is basically use his understanding of the Chinese history and culture and civilization, which essentially is the Chinese history as from the first emperor of China 2,200 years ago. And that is a history of centralization and a history of unlimited royal power. And that is what Xi Jinping is building on, using the state ideology, whether it is Confucianism of one variant or not, or Xi Jinping thought or Marxism of some description, to control people's thinking and guide them to do things as the supreme leader, whether you're talking about the general secretary of the Communist Party or the emperor of China, requires them to do. And this is what Xi Jinping is 
talking about of the Chinese tradition. And his approach to the rest of the world is also based on his understanding of what the so-called Tensha concept was supposed to mean. And the Tensha concept was based on the time when China was the most powerful, rich, militarily strong, technologically advanced, and logistically sophisticated country in the world. And the myth goes that when China was in such a position as the most preeminent power in the world, the rest of the world looked up to China, wants to be inspired by China, wants to follow China's example, and therefore they all defer to China and to its leadership. Hence, Pax Sinica prevailed, and all will be well, and everybody can benefit enjoying the common destiny of humankind, as Xi Jinping would say. Let me follow up on that, because one of the central visions that China has for its foreign policy is constructing this community of a shared future for humankind. And that very much links to the Tianxia concept that you mentioned. We've discussed how much influence Xi Jinping wants China to have internationally. But what are the responsibilities that China has under this broad understanding of, of Tianxia? Or community of shared future. If China achieves the power it wants, what obligation does China have to other countries, if any, for example, in terms of upholding international rules or norms? That's a really good question. But first of all, let me clarify. If we go back to the original Chinese language that Xi Jinping used, you really will struggle to translate that into a community of shared future. The correct translation is the common destiny of humankind. The community translation is put forward by the propaganda department of the Chinese Communist Party and is, as usual, intended to mislead rather than to clarify. And the important distinction between this translation is that a community of shared future implies that Members of that community freely joins in, each enjoying agency and equality in doing so, and voluntarily share a future. The common destiny of humankind is something which can be completely hierarchical, centrally developed, and led, and that's what Xi Jinping has in mind. Now, when China achieved preeminence. What does Xi Jinping thought indicate? Well, what it does indicate is that it is not trying to replace the United States as the global hegemon and the global policeman as the United States has performed in the liberal international order since the end of the Second World War. The common destiny of humankind is based on a different precept, which is that it is not based on the liberal international order, but based on a liberal international order having been transformed into a Tensha order. And in that Tensha order, China will be preeminent and therefore does not have to inherit the baggage of American hegemony an American global policeman's role. So there is no expectation or requirement for China to take on a proactive role to tell countries what to do or to interfere in global affairs when they are going wrong. It simply requires others to accept the preeminence of China in return for which China will not proactively go out to tell other governments how they should govern their own people. So it's a significant contrast to the way how the liberal international order under U.S. leadership or U.S. hegemony operates since the end of the Second World War. Xi's understanding of the Tianxia concept seems similar to how emperors in imperial China used to govern. In other words, emperors relied on local aristocrats or rulers that were more or less 
governed each of their different regions. However, local rulers then had to pay tribute to the emperor, and the emperor sought to balance the power between the local rulers so none of them would be able to challenge the emperor's rule. Is that largely the model that Xi Jinping has in mind under his Tianxia concept when it comes to the role that China would play internationally? In other words, a very loose form of government where China has relatively few responsibilities aside from maintaining the overall international order. Well, in a word, yes, I think that is basically what Xi Jinping's general direction of travel is being implied. In terms of the relationship between China and the rest of the world, is China not directly interfering with other people's affairs as long as they accept Chinese leadership? But the downside to it is that if there were crises in the rest of the world, you cannot count on China to come out to find solutions for them. China may pronounce, but it will not necessarily pay the price of interference, which is, in a sense, what the United States have been doing as the global policeman in the liberal international order. It's also something which inherently is expected of the UN Security Council since the end of the Second World War. The Tensha paradigm will make the Security Council a lot less proactive in terms of international security challenges. Thank you. One more follow-up on this, and then I want to pivot to a related topic. I think this concept makes a lot of sense theoretically, but it seems to me to be not very well suited for modern day dynamics, and particularly given how much globalization there is and how developments in one region could have cascading effects on other regions. Just look at the extent that China is being impacted by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I want to get your thoughts on that and whether you're seeing that there is recognition within China, perhaps below Xi Jinping, that there are fundamental contradictions in Xi Jinping's political thought that don't necessarily align with how we're currently seeing the world and how developments occur internationally. My response would be that my personal opinion is that Xi Jinping's ideas can work and it won't work. But that's not what Xi Jinping believes in. And within the Chinese context, it's now nearly politically impossible for any of his lieutenants to advise him directly and openly and frankly that his conception are problematic. Now, in the specific example that you have cited about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, let's take ourselves back to the early spring or late winter of 2022, when the invasion started and then got boxed down for the Russians. Now, China even though Xi Jinping was consulted or informed of the Russian intention when Putin went to Beijing at the start of the Beijing Olympics, Winter Olympics, China did not really need a war in Ukraine. China had very good relationship with the Zelensky administration in Ukraine before the Russian invasion started. But then when Putin met with Xi Jinping. Putin almost certainly would have informed Xi Jinping of his intention and Xi Jinping would have given his blessings. And if what Putin told Xi Jinping was quite simply that once we have got Ukraine sorted, which will be done quickly and effectively, you will have an administration in Kyiv that would be even more friendly to China than the current government under Zelensky was there not to like. But once the Russian invasion got boxed down, China or Xi Jinping was uniquely well placed to play a peacemaker role. And that would have hugely improved China's standing globally as a leader, which Xi Jinping craves. So your normal international relations theory would have put Xi Jinping in a position where he would be best placed to 
deliver shuttle diplomacy, being the only global leader who could have gone to Moscow, talk to Putin, and then tell Putin, I'm going to fly to Ukraine and talk to Zelensky, and you will make sure I will get safe passage. And there's no way that Putin would disagree to that. Not even President Biden, he could not do that. But Xi Jinping did not even consider that option. Instead, in April 2022, Xi Jinping unveiled the Global Security Initiative. Now, April 2022 was a time when Europe and the United States focused on the threats to the traditional security of Europe re-emerging and the risk of an energy crisis emerging in Europe in the winter of 2022. But at a time when countries in the global south were beginning to worry about food security that may happen in a matter of months for them, and much more immediate energy problems for them because of the disruptions of the war. And the Global Security Initiative was about telling everybody with countries in the Global South in mind in particular, that the security of each and every country is equally important, implying that Europe should not have priority over Africa or the Middle East or elsewhere. And that gave China a hell lot more leverage in terms of engaging with the Global South than he was trying to do if he had attempted a shuttle diplomacy which may not have been successful. And this is really the kind of behavior that shows you the priority Xi Jinping has is to win over the support in the global south for his agenda in the international organizations rather than deal with the kind of specific security challenges that emerge in whichever parts of the world it may happen to be. So there's a lot to unpack here, but I do want to pivot towards another topic, which is the concept of national rejuvenation. You touched on this earlier, but to what extent do you see Xi Jinping's understanding of national rejuvenation as driving the rest of his policy, both his foreign and domestic policy? To what extent is national rejuvenation core to Xi Jinping thought? Oh, national rejuvenation is absolutely core to Xi Jinping thought. Because the Xi Jinping thought is about the fulfillment of the China dream of national rejuvenation, which is required to be accomplished by the end of 2049 at the latest. So sometimes they say 2049, sometimes they say 2050. Really, it's the end of 2049, the centenary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. And that national rejuvenation means. China domestically must be rich, powerful, united, and beautiful or green. Externally, it will have to take places like Taiwan back into China and establish itself effectively as, if you like, the first nation in the world that everybody will be respecting China for what it will be by that point. And only if all these are being achieved is the national rejuvenation fully deliver. So there are huge ambition that Xi Jinping is focused on delivering to China. And let me add very briefly that when I start off by talking about she thought is focused on one country, one people, one ideology, one party, one leader. The one leader dimension is added because there is absolutely no arrangement being agreed to or allowed for succession to Xi Jinping. She is not expecting that he will not be able to see the China dream being fulfilled by 2049, 2050, by which time he will only be a very youthful 95. I do want to link this back to China's foreign policy. 
So given what you described about Xi Jinping's political thought, Xi's worldviews, and his ambitions, how can he be best deterred from using force against any of China's neighbors? The clue to that was the first major speech Xi Jinping made when he became leader of China in 2012. When he refers to the collapse of the Soviet Union, he was reminding his comrades in the Chinese Communist Party that for that great fraternal party, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the problem was when a traitor like Gorbachev emerged among their ranks, comrades were not man enough to stand up against the traitor and the great Communist Party of the Soviet Union collapsed. This is not going to happen in my war. Now, the lessons to draw here is that for all his exuberance and articulation of confidence, he is acutely aware that the political system he leads can have an Achilles heel. And when he sees a basic threat to the Communist Party and therefore his hold to power, he will do whatever it takes. If that means reversing himself, so be it. We have seen him done that when he reversed himself over the zero COVID policy at the end of 2022, when the anti zero COVID protests included among their ranks people who were holding up blank papers in protest. She could see that that's a challenge to the authority of the party and therefore to him. And he suppressed them and reversed the zero COVID policy to remove the cause for that protest. If we apply this to the foreign policy and security policy dimensioned, China under Xi Jinping cannot be deterred by conventional military deterrence. Because there's no general or admiral in the Chinese system today who will dare to tell Xi Jinping that China should act on that military deterrence. But if the U.S. can mobilize the democratic countries of the West in Europe, in Japan, in Korea, and a few others, and collectively send a message to China that if you persists with a particular course of action, for example, invading Taiwan, we will break off our economic relationship with you. And that will mean the Chinese economy will be in a complete tailspin. Even Xi Jinping himself will immediately see that this will pose a basic challenge to his and the Communist Party's capacity to stay in power in China and that, I think, is the most effective way to deter him. But it will have to be a very credible threat from a united group of the leading Western democratic economies. Thank you. This is very fascinating. So you are providing a recommendation for how to deter Xi that is very different from how we conventionally think about deterrence on the defense or security side. From your perspective, you view anything that could cripple or undermine the CCP as the most important way to deter Xi Jinping. In other words, the military balance of power is less important. I will add to clarify is that it has to be something that Xi Jinping himself can see and understand immediately. If it requires some advices in the Chinese systems to explain to Xi Jinping that deterrence won't work. Deterrence doesn't work when the ones to deter has the capabilities to deter. It works when the one that needs to be deterred can see the risk of not accepting and acting on that deterrence. And the replacement of the base by an echo chamber in the leadership of China means that there's nobody who can tell Xi Jinping that he should be deterred. 
Thank you so much, Steve, for this rich discussion on Xi Jinping's political thought, on helping us understand him as a person, as well as his ambitions, and what that means for China's foreign policy and domestic policy. I wish we had more time, but I think we'll need to wrap up here. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for having me. <laughs>